the government's borrowing of money for the purpose of injecting cash into society, bailing out banks, brokers, and consumers. I don't think that they even know what they've made. Is a short-sighted, easy decision for a population that has not yet learned <laughs> that short-sighted, easy strategies. So do applicants ever get rejected? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Look, if they get rejected, I suck on my job. Well, even if they have no money? Well, my, my firm offers uh, ninja loans. Oh, yeah. No income, no, no job. You know, I just leave the income section blank if I want. Corporate doesn't care. These people just want homes, you know, and they, they go with the flow. Are the route to long-term ruin. Welcome to Finance in Five. So, Dr. Burry, what is this inflation about which you speak? Prepare for inflation. Reopening and stimulus on the way, he says. Pre-COVID, it took $3 of debt to create $1 of GDP, and it is worse now. In an inflationary crisis, governments will move to squash competitors in the currency arena, Bitcoin and gold. This is an interesting thought revealed in a recent Burry tweet. But first, what precisely is inflation? Well, I'm sure you're already well aware. It takes place when the number of dollars, pounds, yen or euros or whatever currency you want to consider being printed exceeds the sum total of goods and services within an economy, causing prices to increase. Some people might think that that's a good thing. For instance, a business owner might be excited to charge more for his or her product. However, it should be fairly obvious that since these costs are passed along supply chains, your overall purchasing power as a consumer also decreases, meaning you're actually worse off since you can buy fewer items than before with the same amount of money. The consumer price index is a misleading metric when it comes to revealing to you what the empirical level of price inflation actually is. And this is because governments rely on what they call a basket of goods for their measurements of whether or not prices are rising. And those goods can be swapped out on a whim, leading to substitution bias. For example, consumers may start preferring less steak. Meanwhile, clothing demand goes up. In free market economies, price changes may affect the preference or demand for certain goods over others. And presently using CPI as the calculation cannot explain these changes, but it doesn't matter what the government says. People aren't stupid. They know that the cost of goods is increasing. It's something they notice each and every week when they do their shopping. So whenever you hear the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada or the European Central Bank has an inflation target of 2%, what that actually means is that their target is that your purchasing power declines by 2% in a given year. Doesn't sound so good now, does it? No. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the food price index is continuing to rise during 2021. Supply chains are under strain and the cost of meat and dairy is going up month on month. Here's another interesting observation from Burry, presumably about Bitcoin. Let's read it together. Funny thing about currencies that appreciate amidst wild speculation, they are deflationary and incentivize hoarding of the currency and delays in purchases, killing commerce. Hashtag crypto what? The interesting thing is that Burry has put currencies in inverted commas here because he is being sarcastic about Bitcoin's status as a currency. <laughs> and while we did predict the rise of Bitcoin on this channel last year, and while I know that people who invest in Bitcoin won't necessarily like what I'm about to say all that much, I'll say it anyway because Burry is correct here. People who advocate that cryptocurrencies are the best alternative to central banks very frequently allow their enthusiasm for cryptocurrencies to delude them into thinking that governments won't outlaw cryptocurrencies in the blink of an eye in a bid to retain or consolidate power should the need to do this arise. Anyone who thinks that governments aren't ruthless or psychotic enough instantaneously to declare that anybody who possesses Bitcoin is engaging in some form of money laundering pays very little attention to history. Governments are just allowing the crypto rally to continue so that they can sit idly by in the early stages here, chuckling to themselves while everybody's getting used to the idea of money being electronic. Participants unknowingly are programming themselves to accept the central bank digital cryptocurrency wallets of the future. 
This is a necessary stepping stone along the path to taxing and tracking everything that you do. Imposing heavy taxes or confiscation orders will be part of that transition away from paper money. At least that's my opinion. You might hate it, you might reject it. I actually hope I'm wrong and Bitcoin rises and isn't confiscated, but we're just going to have to see what happens. Anyway, since the start of lockdowns and the printing of currency by the Federal Reserve and other central banks, you've probably already noticed that while the number of currency units in circulation has exploded, the pool of assets globally, whether that's shares in companies, gold in the Earth's crust, number of Bitcoin units mined, or approximate number of real estate properties, has increased far more slowly, if at all. As a result, inflation of asset prices has taken place simply as a result of more paper currency units chasing the same pool of assets. Well, I think the degree to which we can tax our population is eclipsed by the amount of our interest on our debt, basically makes us a Ponzi scheme of some sort. And uh, I think that's the point. I think it's very hard to pick that spot. Amid Biden doubling capital gains taxes to 40%, it seems impossible for the powers that be to gather enough taxes to sustain themselves. When we look at the history of national debts in America since the 1800s, a number of salient facts emerge. First, the national debt was effectively extinguished under Andrew Jackson in 1835, and that was before the federal income tax was even in existence. This was achieved entirely through indirect taxes. No tax was levied on income. Elsewhere in the speech, Burry signals his distaste for authority. So I have a problem with leaders. A personal trait which I admire more than his fondness for black metal music. As Einstein once put it, education is what you're left with after you forget everything that you were taught in school. A lot of people are clueless about the German hyperinflation. The images of wheelbarrows full of paper money banknotes leave many thinking that it took place due to the government printing money, but it was the result of a collapse in confidence because of the 1918 communist revolution which had taken place three years earlier in Germany. The Weimar communists defaulted on the national debt of the prior government. <laughs> Nobody would lend those in power any money after they invited the Russian communists in to take over Germany. This had got nothing to do with the printing of money. Wild money printing did happen as a result of the collapse in confidence, but it wasn't the original cause. The default on government debt, not the excessive printing of paper money, is what distinguishes hyperinflation, because confidence simply collapses and then the economy implodes. By attributing the collapse to fiat paper, a lot of people who don't know their history assume that we must be destined to go into hyperinflation ourselves purely because we also have paper paper money. But that's an unsupported and simplistic analysis that simply distorts the entire sequence of events. The spark that prompted the hyperinflation took place back in December 1922, when the German government confiscated 10% of everybody's property and handed them horrible, terrible, useless government bonds in return as a forced loan. Confidence completely evaporated then and there. The shocking reality of government theft was laid bare with that pronouncement. Everybody witnessed firsthand that the government was not their friend. People realised they were being stolen from openly by the government, and they thought they had to get out. They thought, that these communists are completely corrupt slimeballs, I want nothing to do with this country and its hellish currency. So what did they do? They took their money out, as you would do if you thought that all of your possessions were about to be confiscated by a communist regime, and German residents transferred their savings into banks within neighbouring countries. Things which carried tangible value fled the country never to return until political stability was restored. This is why stamps fled to the USA, not to return again until the 1960s. But what about people's lives? Well, life actually went on. People used American dollars and other foreign currency. As countries move towards an inflation crisis, it's confidence that collapses, and so they turn to an external currency where confidence remains intact. The American dollar probably will still rise and its usage will remain in cash transactions. Ukraine is currently using the US dollar in the face of their currency's inflation. Zimbabwe has lost the right to print its own money. People use the currencies of other nations to this day. The same result took place years ago 
in Japan when the government lost the confidence of the people and Japan was unable to produce money that people would accept. The Japanese used rice and Chinese coins, but not their own currency for hundreds of years. The French Revolution erupted because of taxes and austerity. The debt default and hunting the rich, which completely destroyed the economy, was a revolutionary reaction. When nobody will do business anymore, what happens? People hoard cash and everything implodes. This is all part of the natural process of the decline of confidence in the government. This is why the system that we currently have in the West is unsustainable. We will be heading into a great monetary crisis very soon, and perhaps the quick it happens the better as far as i'm concerned it's time we allowed the out of control high speed train of government spending to collide at once with the immovable wall of an unpayable debt burden only then can we expect to crawl free from the smoldering wreckage a problem cannot be solved if it can never be acknowledged and i don't see acknowledgement happening in all probability, a cashless society will be arriving in Europe before it will appear anywhere else. Unless and until, dearest friend, you begin to understand that all governments are in their death throes, very little of what I'm saying to you in today's video will make much, if any, sense whatsoever. Instead of stepping back and looking at what we're facing with the economy from a practical perspective, the people in government remain fixated on this enormous debt crisis that seems to be propelling them to raise taxes aggressively and constantly, and and which seems to be threatening wars with foreign nations. These are all agonal gasps, really, characteristic of totalitarian regimes. It's virtually impossible for those in government to critique the actions of government from an outsider's perspective and ask questions like, should we really continue with this borrowing and debt accumulation that has a 50-year proven track record of abject failure? Or should we try something new? The list of things that won't happen, but should happen, goes on and on. We should carefully consider what one trillion means. All personal income taxes collected in the US in a year do not add up to one trillion dollars. So why continue to raise and collect huge taxes from everybody? Because many top politicians are bereft of creativity or abstract thinking and simply go along with their party's agenda. They attach a sense of identity to the fact that they're in government and whether genuine or false, display deference to those higher in authority to them, defending their honor even if doing so is ridiculous because it ensures their survival within a bloated bureaucratic machine. Some know that the system is too big and will probably destroy them too in the end, but they're too invested mentally and emotionally to admit that to themselves or to the public. So the die is cast. And instead of honor, instead of respectability, instead of leveling with the citizens and voters and acknowledging that it's not possible for us to collect enough revenue in taxes from present or future generations to sustain this decades-long system of spending, borrowing, taxing, borrowing more, spending more, rinse, repeat, without the very edifice of Western civilization crumbling to dust before their very eyes, instead of any of that, collectively they adopt this conscious process of walking around like hypnotized automatons and defending the party line which all of them know in their gut is a lie. They firmly believe that if everybody paid their taxes, they'd have no problem. Of course, the absurdity of such a belief is outweighed only by the vexing and disturbing reality that some people actually possess it, or are possessed by it. Whatever they collect will never be enough to sustain their power. Over here, in the communist worshipping hellscape once known as Europe, there is already the tradition of cancelling the paper currency. This was always done to prevent people from hoarding cash and not paying their taxes. This was a step in the direction of a cashless society because it was intended to add risk to accumulating cash and not paying taxes. Many bureaucrats have even suggested adding expiry dates to banknotes to promote spending. Hyperinflation only takes place when confidence in governments collapses. When governments are on the hunt for taxes, you actually get the opposite, which is deflation. And that's when people curb their investments and hoard their wealth and their savings. The elimination of physical money presents a new twist, though, to the historical record. Hyperinflation in the classic sense doesn't really become possible anymore because there's no printing of money to pay bills. Assets rise in value, reflecting the fear of government. And this is the emotional equivalent to hyperinflation. But volatility just transposes over to asset prices, where we're seeing inflation of asset prices right now. Nobody's going to buy government bonds, capital hoards and hides in assets whenever and wherever possible. There's no doubt going to be a rise in the black markets worldwide based upon a barter system. This is why many pundits are recommending old silver coins which are easy to recognize, ones which the average person can identify by a simple date. So to sum up, what are the two requirements for hyperinflation? 
as we continue to debase our currency. Well, number one, there has to be a complete collapse in the confidence of the government. Number two, the government can't borrow anymore and can only create money in order to survive. Bernanke says he is not printing money. I again, again, I disagree. So what we're going to see first in all likelihood before ever reaching that point in the United States especially is the significant impact of what some economists are calling stagflation. Rising taxes increase the cost of doing business and cause prices to go up. However, they rise only because of rising costs. At the same time though, demand isn't going up. That's because when people lose jobs and livelihoods, they cut back on their spending. Therefore, you have rising prices defined as inflation, but without the economic growth or demand to accompany those which either decline or stagnate. So what emerges is what some economists call stagflation and this instigates civil unrest because of the fact that the standard of living declines alongside the average net disposable income. So when the average family can't afford anymore to keep a roof over its head or to keep the lights on because of endless taxes and government stupidity, that's when you start to see blood in the streets. So we're entering a period of stagflation characterized by declining economic growth. The bigger the government becomes in whichever country you care to consider, the more that it has to extract from the economy in order to sustain itself, much like a cancer characterized as it is by the wild duplication of useless material plus an invasive tendency to overwhelm and destroy healthy structures, expediting death. So I guess the takeaway really is that we all need, if possible, to pray that this entire system collapses quickly so that we can try and pick ourselves up, hopefully without World War III happening anytime soon. Anyway, I do trust that you've enjoyed this presentation. Next time, perhaps it'll be slightly less unhinged, but I'm sorry I had to just level with you about the true extent of the horrors we face by the morons in power. I'm sure you're already well aware, but until next time, take it easy and I'll speak to you very soon. All the very best.